Ladies and gentlemen, faculty, staff, administration, thank you very much, students. Thank you very much for attending today's uh, science speaker series. Uh, before we get started today, I wanted to let you know about our final installment of the science speaker series. We'll be holding our final speaker series on Wednesday, March 11th at 3 p.m. in Miller Library. The event will be titled Women in Research and will feature three of our faculty members here from WNMU, Dr. Ilya Medina from Chemistry, Dr. Jennifer Johnston from Psychology, and Dr. Kimberly Petrovich, Dean of the School of Nursing and Kinesiology. They will all be speaking on the current research they're performing as well as the benefits of research for mentors and students. So if you guys have any time on March, Wednesday, March 11th at 3 p.m., please stop by the Miller Library and you'll start seeing advertisements for this uh, coming on Monday. So for today's event, we have a very special guest, Dr. Vince Clark from UNM. He's a professor of psychology and neuroscience and also the founding director of the Psychology Clinical Neuroscience Center. Dr. Clark's uh, research focuses on combining neuroimaging with brain stimulation to find the brain basis for cognition in healthy people, as well as finding uh, the, uh, how this is disrupted within clinical populations. So without any further ado, please offer a warm welcome to Dr. Vince Clark. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for inviting me. Happy to be here. Um, so what I'm going to do today is talk a little bit about, about my history as a background. Um, what I'll try and show you is that I spent a couple decades working on something that in the end was doomed to fail. And not just me, a lot of other people. And realizing that was important. Finding a way out of this problem is important. So my talk today will be sort of setting up what the problem is, trying to get you to understand that, where we are today, and where we need to move in the future. So my background, um, I trained at the University of California, did a postdoc at National Institutes of Health. My first faculty job was at the University of Connecticut. Um, and then in 2002, I moved to Albuquerque and had helped set up what is now the Mind Research Network. The work I've done has all been focused on uh, neuroimaging, so the question of how the brain works. Um, the Mind Research Network is uh, its a relatively large facility. It was funded by um, uh, earmarks, actually, from Senator Domenici, our, our late senator, who had a schizophrenic daughter and thought that more research needed to be done on the brain basis of mental illness. So um, using some of those funds, we put together this facility. Um, part of that is we have the first mobile MRI capable of doing functional brain imaging that we know of in the world. Um, since then, there's been a few others, and we ourselves just bought a second one. It's so successful. What we do with this device is um, send it to local prisons. It turns out to be easier to get an MRI into a prison than to get an inmate out of prison. <laughs> so we pour a cement slab. What, what you need is a cement slab, uh, a high voltage electrical connection, which costs about 10,000 or so to get set up, and a garden hose for water, and you're good to go. And you can do brain imaging inside uh, a prison. Inmates are so bored, they will do anything for $2 an hour. So. At this point, we have many thousands of inmate brains that have been scanned, looking at relationship to different behaviors and different questions about the brain basis of um, uh, criminal behavior. It really looks to me now, based on all that, that a lot of criminal behavior could be seen more as a disease than a personal choice. Not entirely, you still have to make that choice, but a lot of people really seem bias, probably from a very young age, to lead that lifestyle and eventually get caught, put into jail. Um, in the same facility as the Brain Center, the Brain Center uh, does imaging in animals. We focus mostly on humans, but we have some collaborative work looking at uh, how humans and other animals com compare in terms of different styles of uh, cognition and brain function. Um, and that's a picture of the facility. It's, it, it's a nice place. Um, 
The main imaging tool that we have, we have a couple, but the one that's used the most is magnetic resonance imaging. And MRI works by, it's basically a very large magnet um, along with some electromagnets and uh, radio transmitters. And altogether, they give you an image of the brain. Um, functional MRI uses a, a kind of weird characteristic of blood. You know that blood is, has iron in it. Iron is very magnetic. It turns out that the amount of oxygen in blood determines its magnetic state, and it changes states as oxygen goes up and down. As your brain becomes active, it needs oxygen, and the body produces, provides more blood to a brain area that needs more oxygen, more, more substrates to do what it needs to do. And the MRI can see that change. It sees the amount of oxygen go up and down and the amount of blood go up and down. And through that, over time, if you have someone here open their eyes, close their eyes, in visual cortex, you can see that when their eyes are open, there's more activity and the signal goes up. When they close their eyes, it goes down. And this general principle holds for nearly any form of cognition you can think of. Trying to plan something, paying attention to something, we can see all of that in the brain through, through this mechanism of changes in blood oxygenation and that its effects on the MRI signal. Um, I'm also director of a COBRE, part of the IMBRE system that Western New Mexico University is a part of as well. And um, we have a number of people involved in it. We support a number of pilot projects, all having to do with neuroimaging of some form or other. Um, I'm also the, the founding director of the Psychology Clinical Neuroscience Center. We got a grant, put this together. Um, it occupies the second floor of the Department of Psychology at UNM. And our focus here, that we have two foci. One of them is uh, brain stimulation that I'll be talking about a lot. The other is uh, EEG or electroencephalography. And um, this is some of our equipment in the center that we use for EEG and, and also a, a magnetic stimulation system for brain stimulation. Um, and EEG, how, how does EEG work? Um, in a fashion similar to fMRI, it's sensitive to changes in brain activity. But with EEG, what happens is the cells in your brain, as they change their level of activity, they're either pushing out or pulling in ions from the surround. And because the electromagnetic force is so strong, it's, it's actually, it's remarkably strong. If two people stood three feet apart and each of them had 1% more electrons than protons in their body, it would generate enough force to literally move the earth. <laughs> so that little static charge you get from touching a doorknob in the winter is nothing compared to what it's capable of. So these tiny fluctuations in neurons are enough that when you put an electrode on the surface and amplify it, you can record brain waves coming out of that neural activity. And we've learned a lot over the years about different brain waves, gamma, beta, alpha, theta, and delta going from very fast to relatively slow. Each of these is related to a different kind of cognition. When we're very focused on problem solving, we, we produce gamma. When we're in very deep sleep, we produce delta. And I'll, I'll be talking about delta a little bit later. It turns out if you manipulate delta, you can help people um, remember things better. So, and we record all this, Pe people wear a, a cap that have the electrodes and wires, and those wires go to an amplifier. So in a nutshell, that's how you do neuroimaging. Very, of course, there's a lot of details I'm skipping over, but that's it. So my career, I, I started out as a graduate student realizing that you could use structural MRI to view the layers of cortex. And why that's important is that different brain areas that have different functions, um, each can be defined by having a different characteristic set of layers. So this is where I started. Um, and early on, I did a lot of EEG and fMRI studies and of different parts, mostly focusing on perception and attention. Um, when I moved to the University of Connecticut, I got interested in clinical work. And one of my first clinical studies was looking at patients with Huntington's disease. 
And I can't go into a lot of detail, but in, there, there are some interesting differences in that it looks like people with Huntington's disease, instead of increasing blood supply to brain areas that need it, actually reduce it. And maybe that's part of the cause of Huntington's, that be, by not getting enough blood, these people's brains are actually dying as they become more active trying to do what they need to do. Um, we've also looked at dementia and um, found some interesting effects where as, as people develop dementia, the way their brains are organized change really substantially. And one of the things that happens is a part of the brain called entorhinal cortex tends to deteriorate. And how the entorhinal cortex interacts with the rest of the brain between healthy and demented people is pretty extreme. But what we didn't expect and what we found is that an area called the amygdala seems to take over from entorhinal cortex. And you use amygdala to see threats. And using this, we could, we could see that people are using this part of the brain that normally used to detect threats to do stuff that would normally be done by entorhinal cortex as they develop Alzheimer's disease. And maybe this is why people with Alzheimer's tend to become very anxious, because they start to see the world through this lens of a highly paranoid part of your brain that's really there primarily to keep you alive in the face of threats. And that's how they begin to see the world. So imaging can tell us a lot about different disorders and give us clues about why the disorder occurs and ideas about how to treat it. Um, another way that we can look at the brain in various clinical questions is uh, what's called an event-related potential that's called the P3 or P300. Um, and this arises about around 300 milliseconds after an event that's surprising or grabs your attention. And it's found to differ in people that have a huge variety of different disorders. Epilepsy, drug dependence, schizophrenia, anxiety, personality disorders, a whole slew of things affects the P300. So it makes a fairly sensitive marker for brain health in a variety of ways. One of the things I did was come up with a way to be able to um, um, have a, a task that's normally used to collect event-related potentials, but use that with functional MRI. The advantage was that you could collect data far more precisely from individual brain areas. EEG tends to smear across when, when you collect it from the scalp surface, it's really hard to tell exactly where in the brain those waves come from. With fMRI, it's relatively easy because MRI is designed to give you very precise information about where things happen in the brain. So by doing this, we were able to see where in the brain um, different phenomena normally studied with EEG occur. And the benefit of this was that um, there, there are certain um, EEG studies in the past that have shown us maybe something interesting about certain brain areas in certain disorders. And we've applied a lot of this to schizophrenia. I've, I've published a lot in schizophrenia. I can't say I've helped anybody yet, but, you know, we, but we, we're trying. That's the point. We're trying. Um, I've also looked at addiction, pain, and aging and Huntington's disease. And the one paper that I want to talk about um, today is one where what we did was to get drug addicts, specifically people addicted to cocaine or methamphetamine, who had decided for themselves that they wanted to quit using the drug. Now, if you talk to someone in that state, they are so emotionally committed to abstinence you can't imagine that they would ever use again. In fact, within six months, statistically, about half of them will start using again. It's really hard to give up an addiction like that. And so what we did here, and this was based on uh, brainwave studies that had occurred before, but what we did, we had 45 patients at an early stage of abstinence, Within a few weeks of abstinence, an average of about one month, we collected data from their brains and then tracked them for up to six months after that. 
And as usual, within six months, about half that group had relapsed and started using again. Then we look back at the data that we collected before they relapsed to see, is there a difference between people who relapsed and people who stayed abstinent? And it turned out there's a, whoop, wait, uh, there's a huge difference statistically. So there's areas of the brain that respond differently in those tasks that would produce a P300 event-related potential. Um, and the largest effect was an area back here. So this is the front of the brain on top, the back and back, left and right. And this area here is called posterior cingulate. And activity in posterior cingulate was really different in people that would go on to relapse versus people that could stay abstinent. Also, um, this area here in the, what's called the right insula and a little bit in the anterior cingulate. But most of the effect was in posterior cingulate. And it predicted um, relapse on its own with about 78% accuracy. If we added a history of mania, so had they ever been diagnosed with a manic episode, it predicted with almost 90% accuracy who would relapse. And um, using some more conservative statistics, about 84%. So we might call it 84% accurate. It's pretty accurate, predicting someone's future. You know, you can never tell what someone's going to do, really. But with 84% accuracy, based on a little brain data and one piece of psychiatric information, we can predict who's going to relapse. And this just this plots all the subjects in the study, the amplitude of activity in posterior cingulate. And it turned out people with a negative amplitude were less likely to relapse. People with zero or slightly positive amplitude were more likely to relapse. And if you compare that to EEG studies, so the red bars, each bar indicates one person who either stayed abstinent in red or kept using in green. And the, against the amplitude of the measure. And what you can see is most people who uh, stayed abstinent are shifted to the right, and in this case had a more negative value in their brain. So each of these is a human being. Each of these is somebody who really wants to stay abstinent. It's easy to kind of objectify them here, but in fact, each of these is a person. And I want to make sure that all these people stay abstinent. So, and a number of other groups, by the way, since, since we started doing our studies, have also seen that posterior cingulate is important for abstinence. So, what does having this information tell you? How can you use it? And I, you know, I, I was really excited when we found the results of the study. I felt like we did the best job we could, and we got the best result that we could have imagined. But I went to clinicians and said, hey, we can predict which of your patients are going to relapse. They were interested intellectually, but they said, there's no way I can incorporate this into my treatment. There's a number of reasons for that. They, they don't want to give patients bad news. More or less worried, if you give them bad news, that will make them relapse. And it's a valid point. They're very fragile at that point. But also, how can you turn this into a treatment, really? What tools do we have to take this knowledge and turn it into a way to help people? Um, and that got me thinking really seriously about neuroimaging in general. Over the years, there have been thousands of papers using EEG and fMRI published on a variety of questions regarding how the brain works. Also, a lot of money, over $7 billion spent by NIH on studies including fMRI alone. A lot of money. But when used on its own, it turns out not to be that helpful. You would think knowing how something happens in the brain of someone who's sick would be helpful. It's really not. Um, and over the time we've collected all this information, mental illness has actually become a bigger problem. It hasn't gotten better. It's actually getting worse. So this shows the relative impact of about 30 different disorders. Um, on the top is heart disease, low back pain, lung cancer, and so on, from 1990 to 2010. 
So over this 20 year period, if you look at the rank order, problems like depression, drug use, alcohol use, Alzheimer's disease, and schizophrenia have all gotten relatively worse, not better. So as we've gained this information, it hasn't helped. And opiates lately have become a huge problem all of a sudden. I still don't quite understand why exactly, but suddenly a lot of people are ODing on fentanyl and um, prescribed opiates that a few years ago weren't. And as people look at the whole question of how we treat disorders, what we realize is that a lot of medications don't work that well. Some actually cause more, more problems than they help. They help with one problem, but then they create other problems. And then you need new drugs to treat those new problems that the original drug created. And you can have people on five, six, seven drugs to treat one problem. And they're expensive. The, the pharmaceutical industry worldwide is over a trillion dollar industry. There's a lot of money being made. Some people get better. It's not that they don't help, but they don't help nearly enough. And um, having, again, all this information about what happens in the brain for different disorders doesn't really help with pharmaceutical development. There's, there's very little information that we've gained that help us design new pharmaceuticals to help with treatment. A lot of drugs are discovered by chance. It just happens, somebody gets a drug, sometimes for something else, and then something else seems to get better. And then they say, oh, this, this is why, you know, you come up with a good story for it. But they don't always know, honestly. So there's all, all these issues. Um, and the other problem is that neuroimaging only allows us to make inferences about causality. So what causes abstinence? What causes relapse? Is it something that the posterior cingulate is doing that causes abstinence? Or is, there, is, is the posterior cingulate affecting other parts of the brain that then cause abstinence? So it's not posterior cingulate, but it's something else that's actually supporting abstinence. Or could it be that those other areas, for some reason, were not getting a good image of with functional MRI, but is affecting both posterior cingulate and abstinence, and there's actually no relationship between posterior cingulate and abstinence directly. Does that make sense? Okay. These are the kinds of problems we're dealing with. All those billions of dollars spent, many, many thousands of papers, and we're not that much better. This is why. Here's what I want to do about it. Neuromodulation, that I'll talk about next, is a way that you can affect a relatively, potentially precise area of the brain and have it act differently. Since our behavior results from the activity of our nervous system, if we affect the activity of our nervous system, maybe we can affect those behaviors more directly than a pharmaceutical clip. And all the information that we get from neuroimaging on where in the brain something happens and when it happens basically gives us a roadmap for the best way to use neuromodulation to affect brain activity. So what is neuromodulation? The idea is that you have a brain inside your head and you want to affect how it acts. Pharmaceuticals look at pharmacology, look at neurotransmitters mostly. And this, this shows what glutamate looks like. Glutamate is about, for every neurotransmitter that's released in your brain, about 90% of it is glutamate. So most drugs affect glutamate somehow. And glutamate is present at synapses, at the beginning and the end of each neuron. And it, it's released on one side, crosses, and then affects receptors on the opposite side. And that's a, that's a big part of how your brain operates, is through neurotransmitters. But what we've really disregarded, for the most part, are um, is the fact that ions moving across the membrane are also important. Again, that electromagnetic phenomena is a big part of how your brain operates. Without it, you'd be dead immediately. If, if ions couldn't cross, if electromagnetic phenomena weren't allowed to happen in your brain, you would just be dead right there and then. 
So it's an important part of how it operates. Mostly, we focused on the chemistry. But what we need to do now, I think, is start to focus more on the electromagnetic properties of the brain. And this goes way back, but pe people have known forever that electromagnetism does interact with your body. Um, it's, there, there's some evidence that Egyptians used electric catfish that you can find in the Nile to treat neurological illness. And on top of that, they thought the, this was a mystical being, and the very first pharaoh of Egypt had an electric catfish as part of his emblem because it was spooky and magic, and everyone knew that, and you didn't want to step on one, so don't step on the pharaoh, whatever. Um, later on, from Roman times to the Middle Ages, people knew that um, another electric fish called a skate could help with things like um, pain from gout in your legs. And what they would recommend is that you stand on one of these things in the water as long as you could possibly take it until your legs went numb and then your gout would be better. Um, Galen, who is an amazingly smart guy, if you look at what he did way back in around 200 AD, um, started out trying with dead skates and it didn't work. And then he realized it must be that the skate has to be alive for it to work and that it's the electric current that's important. He's the one that figured this out. Um, skip ahead 1,500 years. Um, there was a fellow named Galvani uh, working in Bologna. And this, I, I happened to be in Bologna a couple of years ago and stumbled on the statue of him in a square in Bologna. But what he did was he, he had animal preparations where he would take apart a frog and then apply electric current to the frog. And he realized that even without a brain or most of the body, if you apply a current to a frog, you can get it, its legs to jump. And with that, he realized that electric currents are important for how the body operates. Um, his nephew took this one step further and started to stimulate dead people. Um, and this is a, a satirical cartoon from 1803 talking about Aldini's work where he, he, they would take people who had, had just been um, uh, killed, typically either died or killed for, for being a criminal. And uh, what, what this says is, you know, he's, uh, Aldini's managed to bring the corpse back to life and one demon says, oh, no, we lost him. And the other one says, don't worry, he'll be here soon. Um, this freaked people out a lot. And part of the reason I think it's taken us so long to really adapt this as a treatment modality is people are a bit scared of all this. And the, the Frankenstein story, um, Mary Shelley met Aldini at her house when she was a teenager. And then she wrote Frankenstein shortly after. So this whole idea of the scary aspect of stimulation is an important one. But by the end of the 1800s, there were thousands of doctors worldwide that were using electric current to treat a whole variety of illnesses. By the 1920s, it had disappeared almost completely. And I'm still trying to figure out why exactly. Um, to have that level of activity and then just disappear. Um, part, part of the reason, I think, is that if you look at their treatment procedures, they would use so much current, it would hurt. And patients probably didn't like it that much and eventually just stopped going, which if you don't have patients, you can't really do your work. So that could be part of it. But in any case, it became popular and then died out again. But in 1930, um, Ugo Cerletti in Italy developed the method of electric convulsive therapy or electric shock therapy. And it's something we use to this day. It turns out to be pretty much the best way to get someone in severe depression for their depression to go away. It involves creating a seizure in the person's brain. And there's some benefit to having a seizure. People are trying to understand it. We still don't understand it completely. But also things like this. Again, it's very scary. Getting a seizure is scary. Um, jump ahead to today. 
now there's a number of different methods to be able to stimulate the brain to produce changes in behavior. Um, there's electrical stimulation, magnetic, um, infrared light, and even ultrasound applied to the head while alter brain activity. And it turns out the brain is actually really sensitive to the physical environment. So there's a lot of ways to do this, it turns out. And when I say transcranial stimulation, the idea is that you have to get through all these layers, through the hair, the scalp, the skull, the dura, and into the brain without hurting anything. The other way you can do this, though, is to drill a hole in the head and put an electrode inside. And that actually, they're, they're using it for things like treating depression, treating certain forms of motor illness, some of them very effective. And I, I don't mean to disparage it, but the average undergraduate coming into my laboratory for a study is not going to let us put a hole in his head. <laughs> we have to figure out how to do it non-invasively and safely. But for some disorders, this is probably the way to go. Although eventually, my hope is that a transcranial method will take over where an electrode does the best job right now, because it's safer. People do die from surgery. When you put an electrode in, if it moves, sometimes that'll nick an artery, and then you die from blood loss in your brain, um, things like that. So. The first method that, that we tried in our lab, and probably the most um, uh, popular method right now, is called transcranial direct current stimulation. And there, there's actually a, a number of companies that sell these things online. If you don't make any health claims about a product, you can sell it as long as nobody gets hurt. Um, we think the FDA is watching out for us. It only watches out for us if uh, if a vendor, if a, if a company makes a claim that it makes you better somehow, then you have to support that claim. And they have to agree that you supported that claim adequately to let you do that. If you sell a system like this for people that play video games so they can play games better, you can sell as many as you want, it turns out, until somebody gets hurt. And enough people get hurt, actually. But anyway, um, sorry. And there's other systems out there. This Think device is also one that's been on the market. So how it works is when you put an electrode on the scalp surface, that produces an electric field that then penetrates into the brain. Because these neurons use electrical potentials to work, when you change the external field of the neurons, that changes how much effort the neurons need to go through before they become active. So you can increase or decrease the amount of input a neuron needs to become active. And even though it's only a few percent change, this is enough to change how the brain acts in certain situations. Um, Michael Nietzsche, a, a fellow, um, who, he's an MD, and when he was a resident, came up with a way to test how electrical stimulation to the brain affects the brain. And what he would do would be to pass a current through electrodes on the scalp surface and then test using magnetic stimulation to see how excitable the brain became. And what he found was that anodal current, um, this is a, a, the positive electrode on the scalp surface, will increase the level of activity of the brain. And cathodal current, a negative, the negative electrode, will decrease the um, level of activity. So with this, you then have a tool to either increase or decrease what the brain is doing. So how can we use this to infer causation? This main problem of neuroimaging is we can't really tell what causes what. With stimulation, you can test hypotheses that are developed. So say we have a hypothesis that posterior cingulate affects abstinence or maybe nucleus accumbens and, and this reward pathway affects abstinence. If we do stimulation in such a way it affects posterior cingulate separately from nucleus accumbens, that, and then we look at the effect on abstinence. If we disrupt, and it still seems like there's a, re a relationship, that suggests that it's not posterior cingulate. But if we enhance activity in posterior cingulate, and that leads to more abstinence, 
that's another piece of information that posterior cingulate is actually involved in maintaining abstinence. And as a good side product, this might provide us with a new treatment, a new tool for abstinence. So our first studies um, were funded by the Department of Defense. And at the time, um, there, we still have war in the Middle East, but um, it was raging more strongly. And the question we came up with to test was, can we train people to identify threats with better with TDCS, with brain stimulation? So we came up with a task where people had to identify threats. We stimulated, or sorry, we, we did neuroimaging to find out how their brain changed as they learned to identify those threats. And then we used that imaging as a guide of where to stimulate to see if altering the brain areas that seem to be involved in learning threats would enhance their ability to detect threats. So this is um, one of the stimuli that we used in the study. Hidden in here is a threat. Can anyone make any guesses about where the threat might be? And this is designed to be really hard to begin with. So here, there is a rifle sticking out of this bush. What about here? Any ideas? No? <laughs> oh, you're dead. OK. So there is a bomb hidden under the sand, and the different color tells you that. Now, here's one. Any ideas? You guys don't play a lot of video games. That's good. So in the, in the years that we've had this task, people have gotten more, better and better at this task without training. So here, there's a shadow of a sniper along the roof line. So now if I show you a picture like this again, you're going to look for a sniper. So you can learn how to do this but it's not obvious to begin with. So the, the, the training was, we had a still image like I, I showed you, and here, here's another shadow of a sniper right here. And people said yes or no, they saw a threat or not. If a threat was present and they said no, I don't see it, then um, they would uh, uh, press a button, yeah, yes or no, and we'd show them a movie, and the movie would show the thing happening, say someone getting shot, a bomb blowing up, whatever. Um, and then we did neuroimaging. So uh, we'd, we'd see people's responses to stimuli to novice stage, trained to intermediate, intermediate stage, trained to expert, and then an expert stage. And, oops, I keep doing that. Um, and what we saw was, and this is the bold, the functional MRI response to stimuli with threats versus stimuli without. This is a difference in brain activity. And when, when people responded correctly to stimuli. And what you can see is that when people are novices, pretty much the whole brain lights up. But over time, as they learn to do the task, there's a big difference in how they respond to stimuli. And weirdly, it seems like the frontal lobes and some in parietal cortex take over the responsibility of identifying threats as you learn to do the task. And visual cortex actually gets more suppressed. It's a visual task, but you don't use your visual cortex to do it. You use other parts of your brain to do it, which, which is really counterintuitive, and I didn't expect. But that seems to be what's happening. So the area that showed the largest effect is in uh, right inferior frontal cortex, right, right here. And the next largest effect was in right parietal cortex. So what we did was the next study, we took new people that hadn't done the task before, and we put electrodes over right and fear frontal um, cortex and then another electrode on their left arm, and we passed a current through. And we used anodal current over the head, the idea being that we were trying to stimulate that part of the brain. And, but the part of the brain that laid right on top of the area that showed the largest effect with learning. And we immediately got this huge effect. People that were getting stimulation, full stimulation, 
learn the task much more quickly. Over four training blocks, they did much better. And people receiving a tiny dose, about 5% uh, of the full dose, showed much less learning. And if you look at individuals in the study, um, excuse me, you can see that there's, there's a wide range. Some people actually get worse. They sort of give up. Um, but people, people that received stimulation did, on the average, better than people that um, received the, the uh, sham stimulation. Um, this is a big effect. I didn't believe it, so we replicated right away, and we got pretty much the same results again. And the, the, the probability, the, the statistical value of the difference between groups was quite high, um, better than one part in a thousand. We also looked at varying the amount of current, and we found that the more current people got, the better they got at the task. We also waited an hour after the uh, training was over and tested again, and we found that the effect of TDCS actually improved the difference over time a bit. So everybody was forgetting, but um, people receiving TDCS forgot just a little bit less than people getting sham. Um, Let's see, time's a little short, so I don't want to get. And then uh, to make sure it was real, we gave everything to collaborators at another university, and they independently collected data, and then we helped them analyze it. And again, what they saw was a big effect of TDCS. Basically, the amount that people learned was almost twice with TDCS relative to sham. And a, a measure of signal detection called D prime more than doubled with TDCS. It was a huge effect. But uh, and false alarms came down by half. So uh, people got much better at detecting threats generally. But it didn't affect their bias. So they weren't more likely to say a threat was present or a threat was absent. It really didn't change their bias one way or another, but it did change their accuracy. And over a series of replications, we found that two milliamps of TDCS, either over right frontal or right parietal cortex, increased um, uh, people's ability to detect threats relative to sham and about doubled their performance. We also found that cathodal current, so the opposite polarity over visual cortex, also improved their performance, but um, anodal current didn't produce any effect. So going back to the neuroimaging, if we stimulate over areas that showed increased activity with threats, it improved their performance. If we stimulate areas that showed decreased activity, it had no effect, but if we suppress activity in areas that showed decreased activity, it improved their performance. So what, so back to this idea of being able to, to prove this question of causality, we're seeing that the fMRI data combined with stimulation, we can actually better support our claims about how the brain is operating, how the brain detects threats, how the brain learns to detect threats, and so on. So then we came up with another task because we were thinking, well, this is all about threats. Maybe it only has to do with threats. Could other forms of learning be involved? Yeah, sorry. Um, come on, damn. <laughs> oh, here we go. So we came up with another task where people had to identify performance needs to improve. <laughs> where pictures were taken. Um, they're all taken in Europe, but you had to identify Think about what, to look for. What, it, what country it came from. And there were two possible countries. And it's, okay. it's really difficult. There aren't obvious clues, but there are clues there. And over time, again, people learn to do this task. Good job. So we did this. And what we found was that, again, two milliamps of current over right inferior frontal cortex produced much more learning, a, a much better improvement in performance than sham current. And cathodal current also produced improvement in this case, just not as much. And if you just look at the amount of improvement, 
So people in the sham group improve their performance by just 4%. People in the anodal stimulation group improved by over 20%. So almost a fourfold improvement in performance. So taking out the threat, unless you see pictures from Europe as threatening, taking out the threat actually made the effect even bigger. So it's not about threat. There's something else going on. Um, we've looked where in the brain might this be occurring. We were targeting this area. And this is a model of someone's brain where the current would be inside the brain if we put an electrode where we put it for these studies. And the largest effect seems to be right underneath the electrode, which is encouraging. But if you look deep inside the brain, there's a lot of places where current might also be affecting, and it becomes a lot more complicated. And one place that worried me the most was very deep in the brain, in the cerebellum. The current had to go from the scalp down to the arm. As it exited through the cerebellum at the bottom, it became very concentrated. And maybe the effect was occurring in the cerebellum and not in the frontal cortex. So we tried a study um, where we put a, an electrode right over the cerebellum to see if there was an effect. And again, the, these are the results we got before. These are the results that we got with stimulation over the cerebellum. And there wasn't a significant difference between, activity, between stimulation over the cerebellum, either anodal or cathodal, or sham. It's a little bit elevated, but not significantly so. So we can say that the cerebellum's not involved. But that's kind of the complexity that we're dealing with. So all of these areas might be involved somehow in this learning response and not just right and fear frontal that we're targeting. Um, running a little short on time, so I'll skip ahead to an, another series of studies we did stimulating during sleep. So all mammals sleep, most animals sleep somehow. Um, it's still not clear yet why we sleep. We have a lot of good ideas, but we're not quite sure. Um, but one thing that happens while you sleep is that you review what happened to you the day before and you store that into long-term memory. If you disrupt someone's sleep, it disrupts their ability to encode and then recall memories later. So, and the slow waves, the delta EEG that's produced at the very deepest level of sleep is integrally involved, we think, in this memory storage process. So what we did, we came up with a method where we recorded EEG during sleep. We actually built a sleep lab in the Psychology Clinical Neuroscience Center. We recorded EEG while people slept. When they got into the deepest stage of sleep, we recorded the, the delta waves that they were producing. And then we had an algorithm that extracted those delta waves and programmed a brain stimulation system to produce those delta waves at the scalp surface to stimulate the brain to try and enhance the effects of those brain waves. So we were producing artificial brain waves designed to enhance the effects of naturally occurring brain waves to see what would happen. And it turned out that we were able to enhance memory by doing this. So Again, this, this shows the system. We recorded brain waves also while people trained on the same task I showed you before. Um, they slept in the sleep lab. They did the same task where they learned to identify threats. And uh, what we found that was interesting was there were, you could divide up these stimuli into two different types. So the test stimuli either were identical to the training stimuli or shared features with the training stimuli, but were a little bit different. So we could call those repeated test stimuli or generalized test stimuli. What we found was that stimulation had no effect on repeated stimuli, but it was able to enhance people's ability to respond to generalized stimuli. So test stimuli that shared features in common with what we were training, but were actually different somehow. So they had to take that information, process it, and generalize it to novel situations. And they were better able to do that when we stimulated them during sleep. This is the opposite effect that we saw 
when we stimulate during training. When we stimulate during training, it's the repeated stimuli that get the best benefit. When we stimulate during sleep, it's the generalized stimuli that give the best benefit. So the mechanism's quite different. The exact pattern of enhancement is different. But both ways can be used to enhance. And the next step will be to do these together and see if we can enhance both. Um, let's see. One, one of my students looking at this data also saw that the amount of stimulation people got um, affected how much they learned. And it turned out that about 200 stimulation events, each stimulation event was about six seconds long on the average. And getting 200 of those in the night gave you the best memory enhancement the next day. Less than that or more than that, you didn't get quite the same amount of enhancement. Or it could even reduce a bit. Um, oddly, without expecting it, we also discovered that this stimulation enhanced the quality of sleep that people got in the laboratory. So the quality of sleep using a, a measure designed to do that while they were at home gave them this quality of sleep. Their first night in the laboratory, the quality went down. When they got real stimulation the next night, the quality of sleep went up to pretty much the same as they had sleeping at home. But if they received sham stimulation or no stimulation at all, the quality didn't go up. It stayed the same low level of quality. So people actually sleep better getting the stimulation as well. So th this, this is my crew <laughs> that worked on the study. It was a really difficult study. You had to stay up all night collecting data and then go to class the next day. It was really hard. But a great group of people, a lot of people involved. And um, it, it was really an exciting time um, in a lot of ways. I was worried they'd hate me for it, for making them do the study. In fact, they, they think about it in a, in a really positive way. So, you know, phew, I, <laughs> I didn't hurt anybody in this study. But anyway, so can cognition be enhanced using electrostimulation? Everything points to yes, that you can. These replicates are large, or the, the effects are large. They can replicate. There's a dose-response effect. The more dose you give, the larger the effect. Where you put the electrode matters. Um, blinding, it turns out, doesn't matter that much. Single versus double blind, there's really no difference. So it's not that the experimenter is somehow causing the subject to do better by how they interact with the subject. It, that doesn't matter. Um, what you feel on your skin from electric current, um, about half the people that get this don't feel it at all. They think we're lying, that they're getting stimulations because all psychologists lie, so they think we're lying. But in fact, half the people that get it can't feel it. About 1% on the opposite end feel it so strongly that they want us to stop. So 99% of the people that get this can tolerate it fine. Half of them don't even feel it. Um, but none of that matters for the behavioral effect. It doesn't affect your memory. In fact, it's a little bit distracting. The more people feel, there's a tendency for them to do more poorly. But um, they don't do better the more stimulation they feel. And the effects last at least 24 hours, probably longer. So in summary, by doing imaging, using that as a place to apply stimulation, we get a, a, at least a doubling of learning, if not a quadrupling of learning, a huge effect. Um, we're talking now about how to replicate this and what to do next. So it's, it's 3 o'clock. I can go forever. <laughs> how much more would you like to see, really? It's up to you guys. Oh, yeah, please ask questions. So I was thinking about what you're doing, and it, it appears to be increasing brain activity, right? So I had you thought about using a model. So I was thinking maybe Parkinson's disease with a substantial neighbor have reduced activity, right. maybe a problem. It may not be treatable because it's a dopamine problem, but maybe it could. So have you thought about taking to something like that, or ADHAD, where you have reduced frontal lobe activity, and trying to, instead of using a drug from the outside, yeah. use a stimulation to increase the activity of those areas? So, so yes. Um, yes, we are thinking about that. Um, we're looking at disorders that seem to involve the cortex, because 
using this technology, that's the easiest to access. Um, but here, let, let me skip ahead to the, the question I s kind of started with was um, the, this activity in posterior cingulate, how do we tell if that's involved? And what we've been doing lately is not using electric current, but using ultrasound. So ultrasound can penetrate through the skull into the brain. And not being an electromagnetic phenomenon, it, it, it doesn't push back. Ultrasound goes pretty much where you want it to go. You don't have to deal with, with any weird physical laws. It just goes. So, and we use it to image fetuses. It's relatively safe. It better be, because pretty much everyone under 50 in North America has have been ultrasound in the womb. Um, but trying that, what we see is that this ultrasound and using an imaging protocol can actually enhance brain activity in healthy young adults. So we're seeing about a 30% enhancement using two minutes of a protocol used to image fetuses in the womb. If you do that to an adult's head, it enhances brain activity. Now, the cool thing is that we could potentially direct ultrasound down to posterior cingulate, affect how it acts, and see if that has any influence on abstinence. And recently, we did a neuroimaging study. We, we developed kind of a home-built ultrasound system <laughs> designed to be able to target just that part of the brain. And you know, it's, it's made out of a out of a bike helmet, right? It's a little embarrassing, but we'll, when we get money, we'll do much better. Um, and this is uh, Jay Sanguinetti sitting down a, a postdoc in my lab. He's setting up a new laboratory at the University of Arizona to focus on these questions. And uh, Ben Gibson, one of my um, uh, grad students. And so we had subjects. We stimulated the posterior cingulate. And um, this just shows the pattern. So. It's silent for most of the time, and every once in a while, there's a little pulse of ultrasound that comes out. Um, it's designed to be able to penetrate the skull, and we positioned it to focus on posterior cingulate. And then we looked at the brain effects of that. And by doing that, what we saw is that in different parts of the brain had different patterns of response. But we could see close to where we were focused there is an increase in both myo-inositol and glutamate glutamine. That neurotransmitter I told you at the beginning is the main neurotransmitter. Both of those go up where that ultrasound focused. Along the way, though, there's, there's areas along the path of that beam that actually go down. So it may be a lot more complicated than we think. And we're just starting to understand how this works. But in the end, I think ultrasound is going to give us the ability to transcranially get to these relatively discrete and deep parts of the brain that are involved in all of these disorders. It turns out most disorders are disorders of very deep parts of the brain. The limbic system and um, substantia nigra, as you mentioned, they're all very deep in the brain. TDCS won't do it. We need another modality. Without drilling holes and putting electrodes in, I think ultrasound is the only way we're going to be able to go. So. We're starting, but you know, <laughs> it takes time, and we have to do it safely. Um, so we're 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 being very slow and safe and cautious and trying to figure this out as we go. <clears throat> yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, um, you mentioned, see, I told you I don't need this. Thank you. <laughs> you mentioned um, that you think criminology, criminogenic thinking might be a disease. Are you familiar at all with Adrian Rain? Yeah, so um, Ken Keel, who I recruited over a decade now, ago now, is, uh, is the main investigator behind those studies. And he, he trained with Adrian and a few other people. Mm -hmm. So his, what, one of the things he does when he, they go into prisons is to do a, a checklist for psychopathy and then compare that to the imaging data that they get. And the, the big story is that the higher someone rates on psychopathy scales, the greater reduction there is in activity in their limbic system pretty broadly. 
Um, there's a few areas that uh, actually show intense activity, which we're trying to understand still. But broadly, it seems like their whole limbic system, which supports emotion and mood and everything, is muted somehow. So, which, which goes with psychopathy, which is generally the inability to be empathetic to other people. That doesn't mean you're going to go out and commit crime, but it makes it a lot easier if you don't care about other people. <clears throat> and what he's finding is the brain basis of that effect. So, yes. Yeah, which kind of speaks to that whole, I'm really emotional about wanting to be abstinent, but limbically, I can't stay away from the drugs because I'm just drawn to that change in my brain. The, the interesting thing about posterior cingulate is in healthy people, when you see activity in posterior cingulate, one of the ways to evoke that activity is to ask people questions about themselves. How tall are you? What color is your hair? All of that. Posterior cingulate seems to be essential for that. One, high, one theory about addiction and relapse is that people more likely to relapse are unable to calculate how they're going to respond in a certain environment or a certain situation. They either don't know themselves well enough or they lack the brain circuits that can make that kind of prediction. So a prediction like, if I go to a party where all my friends that still use are there and everyone's going to be using, it's more likely that I'll use. So I should avoid it. They don't go through that talk. Right. And they show up at the party, and oh my god, I used again. What happened? You know, Someone else might have been able to predict that. They can't. If that part of the brain isn't working, that could be why. Modulation regulation. Excuse me? Modulation regulation. Yeah. yeah. So, Self-regulation theory. So the idea here is if we modulate artificially, is that going to change the regulation process? Maybe. Yeah. I have a follow-up to, I think, what uh, Professor Helgert was asking. Is the PCC associated, as far as you know, with mindfulness meditation? Yes. And if so, does mindfulness meditation uh, decrease its activity, which I think you're saying is associated with is the thing? folks who are abstinent? Excellent oh. insight. Yes. Okay. I've been debating this for myself for a while. And I took out a good 20 or so slides about our work in mindfulness, which is pretty extensive at this point. But, um, so yes, yes, exactly. That part of the brain reduces its activity as people learn mindfulness with the hypothesis that part of what mindfulness does is reduce your or alter your sense of self. And, and, it, and it goes down, which makes sense. Whether that makes it more likely that if you be, then become an addict, that you're more likely to relapse, I don't know. In fact, the opposite is true, that learning mindfulness um, protects you from addiction and relapse to some degree. Mm -hmm. uh, Katie Wickowitz in, in our department specializes in that in particular. She's trying to develop mindfulness as a treatment for addiction. <clears throat> but it is interesting that mm -hmm. it looks like, at least in that part of the brain, something happens that's not that good for you. So I'm wondering if perhaps, I don't know, but if people practice mindfulness meditation, is it that they get pretty good at sort of, in a way, going into the PCC and being able to self-modulate it and take it up or down? If, if you're saying there's sort of this opposite effect, the people that are abstinent, more likely to be abstinent six months later, their PCCs are, is it overactive? You know, I, I'm not aware. Of the, the story seems to be reduction of activity with mindfulness training. <clears throat> I'm, I'm not aware of anyone showing that people doing mindfulness training are able to willfully increase activity in that area. Okay. They're, they seem to be trained to reduce it, period. Okay. okay. You know, but it's possible that for short periods of time under certain circumstances, people are able to do that with the training. I don't know. I don't know of any evidence pointing in that direction, but I don't know if anyone's really looked for it yet. So maybe. Yeah. You are, um, I, I came in late, so I don't know if you addressed this, but recently uh, <clears throat> I've been reading about the use of, and it, 
I guess is that they couldn't do it if it hadn't been legalized of uh, lysergic acid and psilocybin with the use of uh, drug addiction, depression, yeah. and I don't know if this relates to what you presented because I miss, uh, and what does PCP stand for? I, I used to know. <laughs> oh, but you've been using that term. Yeah, I don't remember. So uh, yeah, that, so that's another uh, set of potential treatments that has had some success. <clears throat> um, kind of social stigma slowed it down for a number of decades. It's starting to build up again, um, which is good. Um, also, I mean, uh, ketamine is another potentially psychoactive substance that has shown benefits in a whole slew of different disorders. But no, that has nothing to do with my work. Oh. Um, we're looking at electricity, magnetism, ultrasound, infrared light, and physical pressure as ways to alter the nervous system to produce positive benefits, but not drugs. Yeah. Sorry. Thank you, ma'am. <clears throat> Would anybody else have any questions? There's a guy in San Diego that every time I give a talk, he's always there asking me about gamma rays. <laughs> and what do gamma rays do? And I've never seen it. They're dangerous. You can't use them like this. But he's so intrigued about gamma rays as being a potential treatment for a whole slew of things. But anyway, pretty much anything you can do to the body affects the brain. And we've been so focused on pharmaceuticals, which can work, but I think we need to broaden our understanding of all this stuff a bit, so. It's not really a question, I want to kind of uh, put you on the spot. I host a drug and alcohol addiction uh, seminar every August. Uh -huh. I was wondering if you'd be willing to come down and talk about the mindfulness, self-awareness, relapse. Do you have a date? Yeah, did you have a date for that yet? Or? Um, it's the first full week of August. I believe it's the 5th or the 8th. Uh, I'm headed up for my father's 80th birthday on the 4th, I believe. So maybe, if you schedule me really early. I'm sorry? 3rd through the 7th. Yeah, kind of tight. <laughs> sorry. Yeah. I'll let you know if anything changes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat>